Well, hello and welcome to ICMDA webinars today. I'm Dr. Peter Saunders, the CEO of ICMDA, and it's my pleasure to introduce today to you Dr. David and Janet Kim, who are going to be speaking about building spiritual resilience with COVID-19 lessons from New York City. And there's few places on earth that we couldn't learn more lessons than New York City at the moment, who've really taken the brunt of this pandemic. So uh, to introduce our, our speakers for today, David Kim, first of all, is a physician uh, and he's the founder and current CEO of Beacon Christian Community Health Center, New York, uh, which is New York's first faith-based federal and state certified nonprofit health center. It's based on Staten Island in New York City, where uh, David was, was born himself and, and lives today. He completed a dual residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at Staten University Hospital. And he also holds an MBA in healthcare from George Washington University School of Business. And as the CEO, he and Beacon have taken the lead locally in both accessing healthcare for undeserved, underserved communities, and uh, as well as in emergencies such as the H1N1 pandemic and Superstorm Sandy. Uh, his wife, uh, Janet, is uh, an, a native of Chicago. Uh, she also graduated New York Medical College with a combined degree MD-MPH with a concentration in healthcare finance and policy. And she also concurrently received an MA in bioethics from Trinity International University. She completed a dual residency in internal medicine and pediatrics at Staten Island University Hospital and joined the staff of Beacon afterwards and her involvement there began while she was still a resident as part of the team starting it with with david uh, they have four children together so uh, let's pass over now to david and janet kim to take us into building spiritual resilience with COVID 19. hi good morning um welcome from new york um this is doctors david and janet kim um so thankful and appreciative to ICMDA and Dr. Saunders for inviting us to speak. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we just pray that the Lord will use uh, what we're talking about today uh, to uh, hopefully challenge as well as encourage everyone that's listening. Um, so without any further ado, uh, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and get started. Um, the title of this webinar is Building Spiritual Resilience with COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> lessons from New York City. And, and given the social unrest and, and all the other crazy things that have been happening uh, in this country, in our country, the United States, as well as other parts of the world, um, as well as, um, you know, specifically here in New York City, um, you know, spiritual resilience is obviously taking more of a meaning than simply just how to prepare for COVID-19 or the next pandemic. Um, really, spiritual resilience is, is what we need in order to handle any crisis uh, that arises. We've had crisis, crises, I should say, um, before uh, COVID-19 and the current social unrest. We will continue to have uh, crises, unfortunately, after that. That is the way that our sinful, broken world is. And so um, we'd like to just share a little bit of what we've learned <clears throat> along the way, at least in the last several months as we've fought uh, coronavirus uh, here in New York City. So. Um, Moving along then, I wanted to start um, uh, with just sort of the basic goals for today. We'd like to discuss our approach to COVID-19 uh, and its background in Beacon's whole person and whole community care model. Um, we'll share our results and some of the lessons learned. Um, <clears throat> we're going to specifically talk about the role of the gospel in building resiliency for any crisis, as I just mentioned, including current and future ones. I'll talk about a few applications off of that, and then we'll leave it open for question and answer period time. Uh, so uh, with that, uh, let's get started. Um, I love this photo of New York City. Uh, this is actually facing south. Um, and so if you uh, look at the, uh, the far horizon here where my pointer is, you will see Staten Island. <laughs> so obviously you're looking at Manhattan with the Empire State Building immediately in front of us facing south. To the right is uh, parts of New Jersey. Uh, to the left of this photo is Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, Bronx is behind you and Staten Island is 
uh, further, uh, further down on the horizon as we talked about. Um, so this is New York City, just to lay it out for you. Um, so um, you have Staten Island at the furthermost portion of <clears throat> New York City. Uh, it's actually the southernmost point uh, in New York State. Um, within Staten Island, we work <clears throat> in the North Shore, um, <clears throat> which is that area circled by the, the red line. Uh, our specific community is Mariner's Harbor, uh, and uh, our uh, uh, area looks pretty much like the photos you see here. Um, this is an aerial shot of a good chunk of the North Shore, including Mariner's Harbor. Uh, and over here uh, is one of two housing developments that we uh, directly service as part of our service catch area, which is pretty much this whole northwestern section of Staten Island. And, and even though that's our our primary area, we, we get people from literally all over Staten Island, um, you know, wherever, wherever the need is, uh, people have, have found us. Uh, so, so for a little bit of background, um, we started in 2006 uh, as a nonprofit community-based health center. Uh, we are now in 2020, uh, pushing approximately 20,000 visits a year. Uh, we do a lot of work related to whole person healthcare, which we describe as physical, mental, emotional, relational, and spiritual health. Our mission or what we do is to honor God by caring for the physical, mental, and spiritual health of our community. Our vision, which is sort of the why we do it, is that we believe that whole person uh, comprehensive patient care has the power to heal people, transform communities and ultimately change the spirit of America. Um, and, and we really believe that in the way that, that we've tried to address the body, the mind and the soul in the way we take care of patients. Um, as uh, Peter uh, already stated, we were at the forefront based on our mission <clears throat> to lead local responses to the H1N1 epidemic as well as Superstorm Sandy. We were the first team out uh, in uh, the disaster area in uh, Staten Island, at least uh, within uh, 48 hours after the storm hit. Uh, we've also been involved with dialogue on local, state, and national levels on level on issues of healthcare for the underserved, uh, and also just the the state of healthcare in general. Um, you know what what we what we need to do to sort of bring the care back into healthcare. And uh, last and most certainly not least uh, for this slide, you know we've also been involved with student ministry to over 17 medical, osteopathic, dental, nursing, and other allied health professional schools in New York City. Uh, we have a very robust teaching program that we'll, we'll tap into a little bit later uh, uh, as we describe some of the ways that we responded in, in the wake of this crisis. So without any further ado, I also wanted to uh, turn this over to Dr. Janet, uh, who's gonna give uh, everyone sort of a background of where we started and what we ended up doing in, in some of what's happened since then. So Janet, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, David. So as David mentioned, when uh, back in March um, is when the COVID wave began to hit New York City. Um, looking back now, um, I think that it was probably more here than we realized. And a big reason for that was because at that time, um, there was really no aggressive surveillance or testing going on. Um, so in the early part of March, um, there was actually a directive to um, to support the local hospitals to um, to defer doing any testing in the outpatient setting um, for two reasons. One, because our testing capability at that time was limited. And the other reason is because um, at that time there were uh, significant shortages in the personal protective equipment or PPE and because uh, the PPE supplies were requested at the local hospitals, um, whatever supplies were available were um, requested to be transferred to the hospitals. And so as a result, uh, many of these patients who were probably sick with COVID were um, in their homes. Um, they were told to be at home unless they needed help and that meant going to the hospitals. And so at the worst of it, um, I'm sure you all had heard about and seen the pictures that we had up to 700 deaths a day, uh, which is still mind blowing to think that that's a per day occurrence, not just a, you know, per week or per month. Um, many people are infected, um, you know, the hospitals were overrun. Um, and people who were coming to the hospital were coming in sicker um, with the higher rates of mortality. But as David um, 
uh, has mentioned in other um, circles of our colleagues, you know, the fear was definitely much more worse than even the disease. Um, and so this is part of the backdrop of of how this all started for us here in New York. So what was our response and what was our observation? Um, we do receive federal funding support. We also are state licensed by New York State. So with those um, significant resources, even despite um, us having um, limited testing capability and even limited PPE, we still asked ourselves, what would Jesus do in this situation? And so going back to our roots, which is the gospel, and going back to what we know um, we do well is our whole person model um, and with a lot of prayer and honestly with a lot of God given providential encounters and counsel um, to be in a situation and to not know what to do in the situation. Um, God really gave so much to us. Um, that was timely. Um, we developed um, a way for us to do some outpatient treatment and monitoring. At this time, and even still to this day, there is no um, standardized outpatient treatment model um, that is being used here consistently in New York and as well as in the United States. Um, but we developed using the resources that we had. Now, we actually um, looked at the research at the time, uh, whether we can use things like hydroxychloroquine. And unfortunately, uh, the governor here in New York had limited access to hydroxychloroquine for treatment of COVID only in the inpatient hospital setting. And so we actually uh, could not use that medication. Uh, so we actually went to, um, use, went to a protocol that we had seen from one of our uh, beacon doctors who has contacts in, with her colleagues in Spain and modified it to develop an outpatient antibiotic treatment protocol, which we'll go into very shortly. But the treatment protocol was part of our overall protocol, which is what we call the four T's, which is what we call, um, uh, which is defined as to test, to treat, to track, and to teach. And we're going to go into a little bit of that on the next slide. Oh, here we go. Okay. So for the first of the letter T is testing. And again, this goes back to just the need for testing. Um, at the time when we were starting this protocol, our testing supplies were very limited. Thankfully, that has definitely changed, but it's still the number one, uh, the first step in any type of um, public health um, outbreak or situation is the testing is critical. And um, from there, you identify if anybody is positive. And for us, as part of our protocol, if anybody developed any type of upper respiratory or even lower respiratory symptoms, they were placed on an antibiotic protocol. And all of these individuals, um, whether they were symptomatic with respiratory symptoms or not, were all placed on a, on a, on a, a list of patients we call daily until their symptoms resolved. And that's part of our tracking system. And then from there, we incorporated um, our teaching component, utilizing um, community health education models um, that I know are used um, in many other different settings too, um, globally. Um, for here, we focus on teaching um, both the patient and the family. Um, oftentimes right now where the greatest spread is where families live in multi where patients live in multi-generational families. And so by educating them on the importance of isolating self-quarantine, that was a key part of our teaching, in addition to supporting them um, socially as well as identifying if there's any needs and resources. And then also we we made daily available to them um, our chaplain that we have on staff. Um, as well as offering prayer if they so wished over the phone for any of the providers um, and also for any of the, the, our nursing and um, support staff that would contact them. Um, we do go more information just for the sake of time. Um, our um, protocol actually was accepted for publication. We do have the link here and um, we will be able to make this uh, uh, link available to you for your further um, information. So what is the impact of our protocol to date? Um, as of up until just recently, um, we are, we've seen over 100 symptomatic or borderline patients. Um, these are, they have not all tested positive in the beginning. We actually didn't treat many if we sus were suspicious for a patient having COVID, but we did include them in our protocol, which included daily checking and tracking. 
Uh, we were able to share this with other similar um, Christian health centers um, in um, the United States. And one key point to note is that out of the work that um, this protocol was able to produce, um, no, none of the patients that we had on our protocol um, needed to go to the emergency room or were ever admitted um, for COVID or COVID-like symptoms. When we compare what we've been able to see and experience at our health center compared to other practices around even Staten Island, um, we just see how God has spared so many of our patients. Um, and we have a very low mortality rate, even amongst our patients, as well as um, for them to be able to have healed from this experience is just very much um, a God glorifying um, uh, fact that we are very much humbled by. Um, and we've also been able to use our, our testing and our tracking, um, again, to raise that awareness of the importance of early testing and early treatment and the tracking as well. Okay, um, but I really like this picture or these pictures. This collage to me tells me of the greater impact that we've been able to make um, through our work. Um, we've also been able to partner with one of the local food distribution agencies here in New York City called City Harvest. Uh, they take uh, food that's been um, left over from restaurants and other um, food um, distributors and able to give high quality restaurant grade food to um, communities, particularly of low income. And through the help of our outreach team, which is the center picture, that's why I put them there because they're the ones that made it happen. Um, they were able to contact um, many of our patients, some of which were homebound, whether it's because they were afraid of coming out because of the risk of COVID or whether they were sick from symptoms um, of COVID, they were able to make home deliveries. And one thing that I really love about this collage is you see all the different individuals we were able to impact from all different nationalities and all different backgrounds. Um, and one thing that our team offered to everybody was offered prayer and not one of any of these individuals refused to receive prayer. Um, to date, we've given out over 100 boxes in just about um, a one month's time. And we're so humbled and blessed that we have these resources, but we also see this as a gateway to be able to reach others who may not know who Jesus is or may only peripherally know who he is. And this to us is really what um, has meant the most to us. So to summarize in terms of the impact that we have seen through this is by being present in our community, we were able to, to show just how present God is and all of um, that, all of the things that we are struggling through, particularly a pandemic situation like this. As we mentioned before, you know, the fear is greater than the disease. And even though the, the disease impact was tremendous, the fear was even more gripping. And what we found was, um, you know, we were committed to continue to keep our doors open. And we came to learn that we were one of the only um, outpatient health centers that managed to keep our doors open, both for inpatient visits, um, meaning in-person visits, as well as um, doing visits, you know, through uh, different uh, telemedicine modalities. But the, the fact that we were able to keep our doors open um, sent a message to our community that we were there. And I think that was one of the biggest um, uh, impacts that we've seen that was made. And from here, having a chance to demonstrate to our community, to local uh, elected officials, um, to our patients, uh, many of them who don't know um, Jesus as their Lord and Savior, um, was a amazing opportunity and privilege that we had. And I think, um, and we can speak more about this during the, the Q&A session, but I think one of the things that um, I, I would encourage for all of our, uh, those that are listening here, is um, how much this opportunity, being able to be present with our community, being able to be there when they were sick and when they, some of them were very much at risk of dying and being there as the hands of Christ um, was the greatest um, privilege and calling that we got a chance to experience. And um, for that, um, I just implore and encourage all of us to keep um, going in that calling that he has called us to. Yeah, I, I just to <clears throat> tag at the end of, of this slide, you know, I, I put a few examples uh, uh, to remind myself to, to share these stories. Um, Janet mentioned that it, it was an incredible privilege to see God working with a lot of our patients. <clears throat> 
And, you know, we, we would visit home visit patients and these patients were cooped up for months and uh, had no family members visiting because of uh, coronavirus fears and, and they were just listless and, 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 and lethargic. One of the families uh, had told us that they were actually considering hospice care because their, their family member was so, uh, was so lethargic and so, um, so, so, so worn down. And yet when we would come and visit and we would bring these families together, uh, it was amazing to see how these patients would just suddenly perk up and um, and 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 start to talk if they could talk or 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 um, or at least engage uh, in whatever limited ways they could with their loved ones and it's just amazing you know Janet <clears throat> often would call this sort of the Lazarus effect that we'd be bringing people that looked almost dead back to life uh, just by being there and, and letting God do His thing uh, with the family members and and, and with the uh, with the patients um, you know one <clears throat> simple and yet very poignant uh, example of this or multiple examples of this were were in the way that when patients would come to see us at the office, you know, we would obviously all either be wearing gloves or, or washing our hands, whatever was appropriate, but we would actually shake their hand and we would say, hey, um, just wanted to you know that we still care. And, and so many patients, this, you know, even now to this day, so many patients are just amazed at the fact that you know, we would be willing to to shake their hand and not be afraid to do so. And, you know, I had one guy, I just remember specifically that broke down and said, you're the first hand that I've, sh I've shaken or the first person that has touched me in the last two months, um, which boggles my mind. But you know, I think it just speaks to the fact that we, we are relational people. And even in the midst of crisis, when everyone's saying, stay away, stay away, stay away, socially isolate, um, we yearn and we, we, we desire to be with one another. And so <clears throat> it was amazing to see how God was using that uh, 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 experience at Beacon to allow people to just recongregate uh, in a safe way, but to recongregate anyway. So what are some of the lessons that we've learned uh, from this? Um, well, the first and most important lesson that we've learned uh, is that we're not in control. Um, that sounds rather obvious, but I can't tell you even now today how many people are struggling to try to gain control over a situation that really they have no control over. You know, we, we, we know that there's a lot of social unrest happening and, you know, uh, I was talking about this with some of my colleagues uh, a couple of days ago that, you know, there's one time bind between coronavirus and the social unrest that we see now and any other crisis that, that we've ever witnessed or will ever witness in future. And that common tying bond is that a lot of times we are trying to solve these problems on our own. We think we have control over it, and yet we really actually find out that we don't. Um, our governor one time when coronavirus was starting to die down a couple of weeks ago came on television and, and proudly told everyone, quote unquote, uh, we're finally seeing the coronavirus deaths going down and we are finally regaining control over our own destiny. Uh, and yet it's him and some of these other uh, of the same leaders who, who proudly boasted of that a few weeks ago that are now wondering how in the world things could have gotten so out of control with the new crisis that's arisen. And so the second lesson that we've learned uh, and we've implemented and practiced with our patients is that the foundation for responding to any crisis is really rooted in the message of the gospel. Uh, and there's a lot of verses that we could have alluded to in, in, in addressing this, but <clears throat> the verse that, that came to mind as I was preparing this presentation uh, comes from Galatians 2.20. And for those of you who don't know it off the top of your head, it, it goes like this, right? I am crucified with Christ, therefore I no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in me, and the life I once lived in the flesh, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the gospel in, in one sentence, and really what it focuses on is the transformative aspect of the gospel, that when we look at other people, when we have the gospel in us, when we have Jesus in us, we recognize that one, we're victorious, right? We've, we, we're, we, are, we are hooked up with somebody who's conquered death, no better place to be than there. The second thing that you realize is that it completely shapes and changes the way we look at people. Um, we no longer look at people in a in a, uh, a, a contractual way or in a in a in a power struggle sort of way. We look at people as God made them in the imago Dei, in the image of God. And we realize, that as much as we've been broken, they need to be healed of their brokenness as well. 
um, we have to then face our innate soul, sinful brokenness. Uh, which leads to the next lesson that we learned, which is again something we've applied in everything that we've done uh, here at Beacon, and, and that is that who we are is more important than even what we do. Um, our human being, you know, defines and shapes our doing. That's why we're called human beings, right, and not human doings. Um, you know, we, we're focusing so much in the media and in and, and, and even around here in New York City about things we have to do. We have to fight this. We have to change that, and yet we first have to be sure of who we are in Jesus before we can determine how God will use us in this world. Um, you know, any change that takes place, we know ultimately doesn't happen just because we tried hard enough or we did enough protesting or we, you know, in some cases, some cases people would say, you know, you know, if we smash enough windows, you know, we really need to, to go back and say, okay, what does, what does scripture say about who we were before Jesus and who we are now because of Jesus. And that, when we realize that, that we are truly not in charge, that, that we owe everything and we, we depend on God for everything, that's how we begin to recognize how God himself is using us to change the world for himself. Uh, and without that transformative gospel of Jesus Christ, you know, solutions for our world are going to fall short and nothing can become new, right? Second Corinthians 5, 17 says, you know, if anyone be in Christ, behold, he is a new creation. Um, and so we really need to figure out a way to lovingly but firmly tell people that the problem is actually not racism per se, and it's not coronavirus, and it's not any other crisis that you can name. There's a deeper issue there's a deeper brokenness that we have to, uh, that we have to address. Um, and that is the brokenness of our sin. And, and, and beginning to address that and understanding our need for a savior uh, then helps us to recognize how that savior saves us in all these other situations. Um, we can't control everything, <clears throat> but we can act in obedience to the word and in the hope and the confidence that the gospel gives us as creations of God. Um, right, Ephesians 2.10 says that we are God's handiwork created for the things that God has prepared for us from long ago. And so when we recognize that God has made us in his image and also completed us in Jesus Christ to be able to do that which he has called us to do, um, we then can see, if you go further on in Ephesians, we can see how God is then going to be able to allow us to do more than we can even imagine. Um, at the end of the day, my pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian Church, David Bisgrove, probably has said it best, you know, the only difference between us being broken, sinful people and the broken, sinful people that we're taking care of is that we have experienced and we have known the cosmic cure for the cosmic disease. And we have that. It's not that we have to hope for it. It's not that we have to pray for it. We have that. If we have Jesus as Lord and Savior of our lives, the biggest lesson we've learned here is that we already have the power at our disposal to be able to be used by God to be change uh, agents in the world. And not because we came up with brilliant stuff, but because God himself is using all of us, those of you who are listening on, the, on this call, to, to make that change. Um, and so let's continue to be uh, because it's our being that def defines what we do. And we certainly learned that in New York because so many people were responding to us, not because of what we did. They respond to us because they recognized who we were. And, and you know, we, we could talk about, you know, the people who came to know Jesus because of what our staff did and, and, and you know, lives that were, that were changed. Um, but I think it's, it's fundamentally not really because of anything that we did. It's because we acted out of who we knew we were. Um, so COVID-19 then, and all the other past, present, and future crises are evidences of our ongoing sinful brokenness and, and cannot be solved by man alone. I think we've, we've discussed this already, but, you know, to practically apply this, um, whether it's COVID-19 or the current social crisis or any other, uh, crises, um, oh, that happened there. Okay. Uh, we have to develop the spiritual resiliency needed to stay focused on the important things in any situation. We have to continue to be engaged in the world while not being of it, right? We, we know that from John 17. But we also have to remember that God has already overcome the world, right? He, he has said that, Jesus has said that in John 16, 33. So then we also need to ask in every situation, what would Jesus do? 
um, you know, Charles Sheldon asked the famous question in his uh, brilliant book, In His Steps. Um, and, you know, some of what Jesus would do is what he said, you know, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Many of you uh, may have done that who are listening uh, wherever you uh, wherever you are serving uh, to fight coronavirus. Um, we certainly are, uh, uh, we've certainly seen evidence of that here in New York. <clears throat> uh, we certainly counted our costs and did it ourselves. Um, and so that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, the other aspect of it, uh, and possibly the greater aspect of, of what Jesus would do in these situations is to, to love our enemies. <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, we're certainly not doing a very good job of loving our enemies right now in this world, um, and yet <clears throat> we need to do that. And Luke six twenty two says that we're going to be we're going to be hated by the world for this. Um, we've seen pushback already because people look at us and say, "Oh, you bigoted, you know, uh, you bigoted, you know, Christians. You know, you're just you're just you know promoting some dead what you know guy that you think is white." And it's some of the language that we've heard is terrible, and yet we we know what the truth is. We know that it's beyond the color, it's beyond the crisis, it's beyond the pandemic flavor of the, of the year. It is, it is about the need for all of us to be transformed. So the final question I'll ask before we take questions then is how does the transformative message of the gospel elevate us above the human control issues that COVID-19, the current unrest and any other crisis raise? Um, those are questions that I hope we will consider because um, certainly these are questions we have considered as we've uh, seen not only how humans have tried to deal with coronavirus, um, but certainly how we've seen God deal with coronavirus and how God has used coronavirus uh, to bring the world to his knees. Uh, and we certainly pray that people will be listening carefully to what God might be trying to tell them uh, in this time and times thereafter. Um, so with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Ina Sancho Torres, uh, Dr. Sun Young Kim, uh, who helped us with the South Korean part of our protocols, Dr. John Nwangwu and Dr. Nwanzi Jakpona, uh, who worked with us from New Haven, um, the physicians at Servicio Cantabro de Salud, uh, uh, the Department of Health of Castilla and Leon in Spain, and of course, last but most certainly not least, the physicians, senior management and staff at Beacon Christian Community Health Center here in Staten Island. Um, so at this point, uh, Peter, uh, we're ready to take questions and we just wanna thank everyone for the opportunity to share our story. Thank you very much, David and Janet, not, not just for telling us what, uh, what you did, but why you did it and how you brought your faith right into the center of it. So we've got a time of questions now up until the hour and uh, do keep putting your questions in. So the first question from, uh, from the, from the people who are here. There's about 130 people listening to this presentation currently. Thank you for the eye-opening presentation. The most popular advice is physical distancing, but you did mention you shook hands with your patients. Did you do that to most of them or only selectively? And what was your protocol for uh, safe handshaking? We all, all know about the importance of physical touch, but also the risks and dangers. So. Could you elaborate on that for us? Sure. Um, so I would say that there's no specific protocol. It's a great question. I mean, because this is one of the hotly debated issues here. Um, but I would say that one, we were led by what the Holy Spirit was guiding us to do at that particular moment in time. That, that was first and foremost. Secondly, um, we took as many precautions as we could. Uh, we had hand sanitizer in all our rooms. Patients saw us washing our hands before we would go to shake them. Um, we also looked for nonverbal and verbal cues. Um, there were certain patients that clearly looked standoffish. We were not going to force our hands or any other thing upon them, but we sort of went as the conversation went and uh, we would prayerfully consider uh, shaking their hands. I would say that the people that we were, uh, you know, uh, safely touching were people that probably had a longer relationship with us or um, were people that flat out would ask us to shake their hand or people who actually sort of reached out their hands in the hopes that we would shake them. Um, and so we, we, we took a number of factors into consideration, but the most important thing is that, that we prayed before we did it and we didn't just wantonly do it. Um, you know, and, and, and certainly different people will have different protocols about it. We're, we're just sharing the way that we did it. Um, Jan, I don't know if you want to add anything to yeah, that. Yeah, just recently, just even last week, 
um, I wanted to pray with somebody and she was welcome to it. So we basically, we each both took hand sanitizer in our hands. So mm. we each cleaned it so that we also both knew, I, mean, I didn't care if she didn't do it, but at least she saw that my hands were clean. And then afterwards we would hand sanitize again. And I find that um, even if the patient doesn't do that same act by them seeing that it's clean, there, there seems to be some visual cue that gives them the assurance like, okay, this is okay to touch. Um, so I think that has um, been something that I've been trying to incorporate more in. Um, the other thing that I do during the time that I'm seeing patients is I constantly am hand sanitizing in front of them. And not that necessarily that I need it, but because they're seeing that it's okay, that every precaution is being made to make sure that their health is being right. um, kept as, as safe as possible. Right. That being said, we also, you know, obviously we'll respect people who don't want us to touch them and we've, we've done everything. As long as it's contact, you know, we fist bump, we elbow bump, we've done whatever we can to help encourage, uh, you know, touching and also to just decrease that, that fear barrier that we talked about before where people, you know, as I mentioned, there was one guy that hadn't been out of his home and hadn't touched anyone in two months. Um, and so we, we really felt the need that part of our ministry was to just help to, to break those barriers back down and, and re-engage people uh, in, in, in communicating and, and connecting with each other once again. Thanks. <clears throat> There's another question on the same topic, which we'll perhaps take now. That They say, what a wonderful report, human being versus human de uh, doing was a great point. Uh, that they would like to take away and bring to their own patients. But just on hand washing again, they were asking, did you see any adverse consequences in terms of people being infected or uh, interventions or concerns from the authorities? So people worried about that. Mm, no, actually, you know what, it's, it, I, I, we didn't share this during the presentation, but the amazing thing is that not a single one of our staff got sick from coronavirus by being at the health center. Um, we only had one person get sick from coronavirus, but it was because she was working uh, at, a, at another job and, and she tracked her infection back to the other job, not to ours. Um, I think that, um, you know, again, you have to prayerfully consider and you have to, you have to be careful. I mean, we, 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 we prayerfully and cautiously took our steps before we, we did anything. And so there's no protocol that says now everyone should just go out and do it. Um, you, know, you have to see where your patients are. Uh, a lot of what we did was based on the relationships we've had with patients over the years. Um, and, and there were a number of patients that, as I, as I said, were comfortable with us because of a lot of what Jan Janet said, as well as the fact that they knew that we were trustworthy because we had built that that trust with them over the course of, of a number of years. Um, so, uh, so that those were all, again, factors that, that, that played in, in how we would approach each individual patient. So a question here from Hedwin in Indonesia. Uh, some Christians choose to stay at home at all times, doing the helping ministry from home, for example, online ways to be a blessing to others, but others feel encouraged to go to the streets and visit houses of people to serve them as you have done. How do we balance this, our heart to be a blessing on the one hand, uh, on the other, obeying local government recommendations to stay at home? So this is a question from Indonesia and, and mm. probably an area where there's a little bit less in the way of uh, religious freedom. Right. Mm -hmm. I know that speaking with local pastors, this particular question has been pretty gut-wrenching for them mm -hmm. because they want to have the contact with their parishioners um, and by them being at home even by working online or by phone it's not the same as being able to see one another and um, to have that kind of connection with people um, and what we'll share what we've done and it needs to be taken into context for those who are listening mm -hmm. that the local authorities um, you know what, what the local rules are um, will be the context of how much you can apply what, what we were able to do. Mm -hmm. um, throughout the whole time of the COVID pandemic, when New York City was placed on um, shutdown or what they called New York pause, um, essential workers were still allowed to go to work and healthcare workers were considered an essential worker, not just the physicians and the nurses, but our medical assistants, staff who are answering phone calls, um, anybody that is on our staff um, because they 
we're um, working at a, at a health center, which is a medical entity that's considered to be um, an essential worker, was able to still go to work freely. Um, so that's the first thing is, is looking at the local rules and what, what is allowed by the authorities uh, to be able to go in about. Now, we also do do home visits for our medical patients. Uh, we did suspend that because again, the risk of going in to see them wasn't quite worth the benefit of what we could get from seeing them. So those, some of those patients, we deferred to not see them. Um, but there are some individuals, when we were doing the food deliveries, um, when we do deliver them, um, we're still keeping the social distancing. Um, our, our folks are still wearing masks. Um, but now um, there is a little bit more um, contact in that way to be able to go into people's homes. Um, for the few home visits that we have had done, um, everyone goes in with the PP, with their basic PPE, which is a, um, a mask and wearing gloves. Um, at this point right now, we are not, we don't feel the need right now that um, we're needing to do full isolation gowns like we were before. Um, but I would encourage that if you have the opportunity to be able to even see individuals, even in their homes, wearing gloves, wearing masks is, I, we believe it is safe, but then also being able to maintain some distance in the homes, just stepping into the homes can be a huge mm -hmm. blessing to people too. Um, and so really to balance that and also to weigh the risks and the benefits. Um, if there's somebody that really could benefit from having that more direct contact than just over the phone or online, and if it's something that will not put the worker at jeopardy, then it's something to consider and to prayerfully consider, is this the wise thing to do? Yeah, I think one other aspect to, to bring up too is that, you know, there's no shame in doing either. There's no extra glory in doing either in the sense that, um, you know, whether you're working from home uh, or whether you're uh, out in the field, so to speak, you know, whatever you're doing to be obedient to what God has called you to do in your particular place, um, you know, we know we know that just because there might be restrictions on religion and 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 and, and some other uh, re restrictions, you know, that doesn't mean that the gospel can't be spread uh, through what you do. Um, and even if it's just calling someone, if you can't uh, directly go see them, or even if it's just um, sending an encouraging email to a patient or or to a colleague, um, you know, I think I think the the key thing is to prayerfully consider what God is allowing you to do at that particular moment and then do it you know and i think that's where you know we really want to encourage people i mean look at us we you know we 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 we, we never believed that we would get to this place because all we were trying to do was figure out a way to stay open so we could test people in our community that were just deathly scared of this disease and had no other testing options, had no clue who to turn to, and were just scared stiff because the media was telling them 50,000 times a day that they were all going to die. So, um, you know, we just tried to be obedient at that point and 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 we can't claim any for any particular glory or, or 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 special praise for it simply that we tried to be obedient and i think that's as much as god asks all of us to to follow him wherever he he tells us to go sure from from cheng lo now uh greatly encouraged the gospel truly changes everything and how we see christ sees people in suffering and hate and anger he's particularly uh, interested in a brief overview of how the students and residents are mm. given support and teaching in spiritual resilience as, as they hit the the front line. Yeah, that was a big issue for uh, for our students. Many uh, fourth year students and, and third year students on rotation were actually called to uh, sit on COVID floors in their hospitals. Um, there were also a number of residents who were from other specialties like pediatrics or, or surgery or psychiatry, who were forced to go on to internal medicine floors to treat COVID uh, patients during the, the worst of the crisis. And it was stressful. It was extremely stressful. And you know, uh, our ministry, uh, our, our, our ministry that's attached to the health center, we call it beacon360.org. Uh, and um, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the ministry really, we, we sat and thought to ourselves, how are we going to help these, uh, these people through 
this crisis, not just the, the physical need of figuring out how to do all this stuff, but also the mental, the emotional, the relational and the spiritual needs they would have as they would get you know, more and more tired. Um, and so we, we've done a number of uh, devotionals that we've sent out to our mailing list. We've also done a couple of uh, webinars with our students and residents. Uh, we've been um, you know, ministering to, to those who come our way. Um, and uh, you know, we, all, we also have a lot of materials on the Beacon 360 website, which is actually, I believe, in the presentation. Uh, you know, the website uh, is in the presentation. So uh, people can go on it and look it up. Um, but um, you know, we, we've really just tried as best as possible to stay engaged, um, addressing fears. We're also working closely with CMDA. Uh, Dr. Steve Sartori in the Center for Wellbeing uh, here in America has been an invaluable resource to helping us to uh, to point students and residents and anyone else for that matter to uh, counseling and, and, and coaching resources in case they, they find themselves so over their heads that that simple peer support isn't going to be enough. Uh, another question, do you think the US government uh, uh, is or will be more open to overtly Christian healthcare delivery because of organizations like Beacon? And then a follow up from that was, what what is what's your own church doing to share your experience of Beacon with healthcare missions and emerging and emerging nations outside? Mm. So the the action of the government or reaction of the government and then your own church's overseas ministry. Yeah, uh, let's tackle the first one first. Um, you know, the U.S. government is a very fascinating creature, if, if, you, if you don't mind my saying so. Um, <clears throat> you know, there are people who are very strong believers in it. Uh, there are people who are very anti-religious in every shape or form in it. And it's been very fascinating to work with them over the years, especially through different administrations. Um, I would say that right now, the current administration is definitely more faith-friendly than, than administrations of the past. Um, and I think uh, in as much as politics, uh, to get back to something I said before, politics can only get you so far. Um, you know, it's really ultimately the change in the human heart that's going to fundamentally create the type of changes that I think we all pray and, and seek God's guidance and how to achieve. But um, in terms of being open to faith sharing, um, you know, that's going to be an evolving situation. I, I think there's always going to be that yin yang between people in government that 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 are faith open or that are open to faith and people who are not. Um, and I think uh, the best way to to sort of navigate that is probably through what we do, which is uh, based off of Jeremiah 29 7, to seek the shalom or the peace or the success, whatever you want to translate that word into, but in Hebrew it is shalom. To seek the shalom of the city that has enslaved you and pray for it, for in its shalom you shall have shalom. So I think working for the good of, of where you are uh, and knowing why you are doing it, which is again the whole being versus doing discussion, um, in and of itself God can use that. Um, now, the second question, um, remind me again, Peter, what the second question was? It was just sure. about overseas yeah. ministry. Uh, have you been able uh, to share the experience of Beacon uh, in, with those in emerging nations? I guess you're doing that today, but, um, but do you have any formal contacts uh, overseas in terms of duplicating the kind of principles that you've used? Um, Janet, you want to talk about maybe medicine and how that's kind of open doors? Well, to answer your question, um, to whoever's ans asking the question, um, I guess the answer is this is our first opportunity to share um, and an international audience. Um, we do have um, other um, individuals that we do know of from around the world. And yes, as David mentioned, um, I am involved with an organization called MedSend, um, which uh, gives uh, grants to health professionals uh, to serve on the mission field around the world. So um, I know that our information has been shared to those that are MedSend grantees working in mission hospitals around the world. Um, and I don't know how beyond that our information has gotten to, but I think it's safe to say that if anybody is wanting to know more information after Absolutely. today, they can definitely contact us. So yes, thank you, David, for that referral. Yeah, and our contact information is at the end of the presentation on a slide, which I didn't show, but it's at the very last slide in the presentation. So please feel free to reach out to me or Janet. We'd be happy to help uh, guide people uh, even further beyond the confines of this presentation. 
Thank you. The next uh, question from Andrew. Uh, thanks for this fantastic presentation. Praise God that he's used Beacon to do such work. Uh, but a medical question that follows, have you encountered any neurological symptoms associated with COVID-19? And if so, what follow-up cares Beacon been able to offer? So based on what we're seeing in the literature and also based on what we're seeing, um, we haven't seen anything from the neurological standpoint. Um, I think the greater concern has the cardiac and the, and the pulmonary functions. Um, now, our experience is that we've had patients that we were monitoring from home. Um, I will say during that time, we did not have access to laboratory testing or imaging um, because nobody is going to do those kinds of testings. And back in really in early April was when it was the worst. Um, unless you were in the hospital, it was impossible to get those types of testing done um, as an outpatient level. So that's something that we are starting to now look at now for some of these patients that had mild to moderate infections, is there been any sequelae as a result of the infections? But I think neurologically, even from what we've seen in the hospital, I do know that there have been a few of our patients um, who did get uh, infected with COVID, but we were not aware until after they came out of the hospital. There have been one or two that did develop um, some seizures due to a stroke. Um, and I think because of the overall pathophysiology uh, that we're starting to see is the thrombotic nature of what COVID can do. Um, anything that can cause that kind of um, thrombotic event, which is I believe what caused the stroke for this individual, which then led to the seizures, um, is something that we're seeing. But at this point right now, um, he's actually recovering very well. Um, and we're just trying to see if the seizures are something permanent or if that was just a temporary mm -hmm. phenomenon. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, this time from Bruce, who's writing from, who's been involved in mobile clinics in a Muslim majority Southeast Asian <coughs> country, and they have people serving as counselors, or well, they'd like to have people serving as counselors. So the question is, how do you choose people to serve as counselors, and how do you train them? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, I wish I had my spiritual care team online with us to help us to answer this question because they've done a lot of the counseling. I will say, however, that just in general, you, you want to find people who are missionally oriented and are actually, you know, they sense that God is calling them to do this. Um, they may not have the calling or the, or the sense of the calling right at that time, but if God is tapping them on the shoulder through you uh, to, you uh, you know, to be a counselor type person, then that would be the place to start. I think people who are really good at listening are critical. Um, in this world, we certainly have a very, very bad shortage of people who are really good at listening. So we really, we really need more people who can listen. Um, and then, you know, people, again, who, who have that sense of gospel being, um, you know, I'm assuming that you're, you're, you're thinking about, you know, some form of Christian or faith-based or faith-centered counseling of some sort. And even if you don't say the words Jesus Christ to anyone, you want to have someone who's got that heart uh, to be able to express that in ways that, that, are, that are able to show compassion and caring uh, to the community that you're serving. So those are some of the general broad guidelines. Again, if you want to send us a question, we can you know, you know, dissect that question a little bit more specifically in your specific situation. Thanks very much. And I'm afraid this will have, there's lots more questions, but I'm afraid this will have to be our last one, but it's getting back to what I think was one of the, one of the key points that you made in your talk, which is that it is far more important uh, who we are than what we do. Mm. And it's, it's just simply, could you please just in a couple of minutes, elaborate a bit more on what you mean by that? Mm. Okay. You only have a couple minutes. I know. I know. I only have a couple minutes. I, I'm going to try to keep this short. Um, well, it, it's simply this, actually. I mean, if we go back to Galatians chapter two, verse twenty, right? If we recognize that as Christians we are crucified in Christ, therefore we no longer live. Jesus Christ now lives in us. Then, what we do is a direct function of who we are. 
right? A secular person looking at the world right now and reacting to it is it should be reacting differently than the Christian who understands who he or she is in Jesus and looks at the world around him or her and says, ah, how is God seeing this world? And what is God teaching me through my being with him to be able to deal with the world? You know, Tim Keller, um, our pastor, at, our former pastor at Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, um, who I'm going to ask everyone to pray for because he just got uh, diagnosed with cancer the other day, literally <laughs> yesterday. Um, you know, he, he, he used to say that culture is what we make of the world. And, you know, culture is such that, that, that we are trying to find answers to the questions of the world. And culture is the way that we answer those questions. And the only true way that we can fully answer every single question the world throws at us is through the lens of Jesus Christ. And so when we remember who we are, right? Ecclesiastes chapter 12, remember your creator. Well, if you remember your creator, you remember that you were created and therefore you have to remember who you are. And as a result of that, when we remember that, when we remember how broken in sin we were and how healed of that sin we are because we are in Christ Jesus, that's what allows us then to act in such a way that we not only look at ourselves as broken yet healed, but we look at other people as broken and needing to be healed. Um, we look at them the same way we look at ourselves because God looks at all of us the exact same way. We are all made in his image, right? The Imago Dei. And when we look at the Imago Dei, we recognize that regardless of the circumstance, we have to love that person, even if that's really hard to do so. So... I don't know if that helps to clarify a little further. And again, please feel free to send us questions via email if, if, if you need further assistance in sort of unpacking that. David and Janet, thank you so much for being on ICMDA webinars, for sharing your wisdom about building spiritual resilience with COVID-19, the lessons from New York City. And thank you all of us for joining us today. So uh, goodbye from me. Uh, thank you very much, David and Janet. And God bless you all. Thank you for joining us today. Thank, on thank you for having webinars. us. God bless. Right.